You are listening to Passions and Prologues, a literary podcast where each week I'll interview an author about a thing they love and how it inspires their work. I'm your host, Adam Sokol, and if this is your first time listening in, thanks for joining. If you've been here since the beginning, thanks for coming back. Really, really appreciate having you all here. Today's episode is one I could only properly classify as pretty epic. I am joined by my good old friend, Penny Reed, romance writer extraordinaire. If you have never read a Penny Reed book, I, that's the first thing I'm going to tell you to do. She has written the extremely popular Knitting in the City series. She wrote the Winston Brothers series. Uh, her self-published romance books have become so popular that there is basically a Penny read verse out there now. She started her own imprint publishing, uh, publishing imprint called Smarty Pants Romance because people were writing really delightful fan fiction. So she wanted to kind of create a space for people to do that in a way that they could publish the books. Penny and I have done interviews for many, many years now. And every time she used to come on the previous podcast that I co-hosted, the conversations would be sprawling and delightful and joyful. And this one is no different. This conversation starts by discussing her deep passion for crafting. We then get into soap making uh, we talk a lot about essential oils, but in a very funny way. Uh, and then we get into all the different ways that Penny famously does very, very in-depth research, ending with a conversation about how she got into interviewing strippers and strip club owners uh, for her latest book, Folk Around and Find Out, which is available now. I promise this all makes sense. This all ties together. Penny is just someone who you could listen to for hours and hours and hours. She's so smart, so fun, so funny. You're going to love every single second of this conversation, I promise. Before we get to that, I want to offer a book recommendation. Uh, I am currently reading and loving How to Be Perfect, The Correct Answer to Every Moral Question by Michael Schur. Uh, Michael Schur is the creator of The Good Place, and he's also the co-creator of Parks and Rec. I'm listening to the audiobook right now, and the audiobook has all of the character, or all of the actors, rather, from The Good Place participating and it's something uh, a friend of mine, Chris, over the weekend suggested I read, and I'm really, really loving it. Uh, it basically goes through all of the like deep, you know, richly researched aspects of philosophy from the last 2,400 years and sums it up in like a thought provoking and very funny guide. I'm really enjoying it. I took a bunch of philosophy classes when I was in college because I went to a a school that had us take a, a several of them. And so it's been a nice like little flashback, but it also is like a a much more enjoyable version of how to understand moral philosophy. So if you're a fan of The Good Place, I highly recommend checking out How to Be Perfect by Michael Schur. Also want to remind people, you can always get book recommendations from me by going uh, shooting me an email at passionsandprologues at gmail.com. If you wouldn't mind leaving me a rating and a review uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, it helps people find me just a little bit more easily. And I really appreciate that as well. Also, uh, just a reminder, I pick a monthly winner to send a bookshop.org gift card to and to quote unquote enter to win that. All you have to do is send me an email with the thing you are passionate about. I just love hearing what everyone is passionate about. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's just a little bit of the housekeeping. You can also find me at Passions and Prologues on Instagram and TikTok. Uh, something else I want to mention, uh, which is uh, really a fun little coincidence, last week's episode was with Nikki Payne, who did a Pride and Prejudice kind of reimagining. Penny Reed has one of those coming out as well called Pride and Dad Jokes. Didn't plan that, that they were going to be back to back, but it just worked out pretty well. We don't talk much about that, but we do get into it at the end of the episode and just thought that was a nice little kismet, serendipity, whatever you want to call it. So, okay. That is all the housekeeping. I want to thank you all for listening. I got some fun episodes coming for you in December as well. Uh, but for now, I hope you enjoy this conversation with the delightful and iconic Penny Reed on Passions and Prologues. Okay, everyone. I am so freaking excited for this uh people who are longtime listeners to the podcast i used to co-host may remember this name as a person who had quite epic conversations with us i am joined by the one and only penny reed penny thank you so much for joining me today 
Thank you so much for having me. I was excited to hear from you. I was like, yay, that's exciting. Uh, so, so. Okay, so you have, all, I like seconds ago, we talked about like six different things. So I'm actually not sure what you're going to say right now, and so that's okay. What is one of the things you're super passionate about that we're going to talk about today? So as I said, I have a hard time settling on like just the one thing. But um, for right this second, I think what I, I should talk about because I can get a free hour of therapy out of this podcast is we yeah. should talk about my deep craft obsession. That's what we should talk about is my deep craft obsession. Yeah, I, I think this works because you have some other stuff that I am going to bring up, like your Halloween <laughs> Christmas displays, which technically can be a craft obsession. So yes, exactly. Let's, let's try to start from a beginning ish. When did you okay. discover a love of crafting and like how did that blossom into an obsession? <laughs> So this is what happened. My mother was an artist, but like an artist and like, oh, I can't, I can't think about that. I'm an artist. And so there was a lot of that growing up. And so art to me was, or anything creative was like a four letter word because it was like, oh, like, you know, you have no respect for my Paul nerves, you know, like that kind of thing, you know, as an artist, she was very delicate. And uh, I can say this about her because she died. And so she won't listen to this. So there we go. Okay. So this is what happened. That sounds really bad. I'm so <laughs> good. I'm going to be muted so much because I'm already giggling. Oh my okay. goodness. Sorry, so this continue. Is what, no, no, no. It's all good. So my dad was an engineer and he comes from a long line of engineers who worked on space program and yada, yada, yada. So I erred more towards that kind of like logical part of myself. But then I got pregnant with my second child and there was this just insatiable urge that everything that touched me or my child had to be something I created. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about like, oh, I'll learn how to knit and I'll knit the sweater. No, nay, I needed to shear the sheep, <laughs> fleece, fleece the sheep, wash the fleece, card the wool, spin the wool. And then, yes, yes, this is how deep it went. And it was like this obsession. And like soap, for example, I learned how to render ash to create lye to, mm -hmm. to, and then also render the fat. So I would get, it didn't go as deep. I mean, if I could have bought the animals to do all of these things with, I 100% would have. But my husband kind of put his foot down. He's like, no, we are not buying merino wool sheep in florida that's awful and we're not buying a cow so that you can render fat to make soap we're not doing that so i went as deep as i possibly could and yeah so i would make the lye and render the fat from cow femur and then i would make the soap and and then i right before she was born i was just getting ready to start creating my own essential oils which is an intense process and you need like glass plates and you have mm -hmm. to do dis distillation. And I had done a bunch of research on that because any, again, anything that touched her or me or any, it had to be all homemade and homegrown. And then she was born and it started to taper off, but I was left with all of these skills. Uh, I mean, not necessarily shearing a sheep because I did a terrible job at that. I tried and then the sheep and I weren't friends and, you know, I think I have, they're still like, like the sheep tried to sue me and it was a bad thing, but the, um, actually it was probably the sheep sheared. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I was getting in there, but I had all these random skills about how like to wash fleece appropriately. So it doesn't mat and then card the wool. And, I, and I've never used these. I've never used these again because the obsession went away as soon as she was born, but I still know how to do all of these things. And so whenever I encounter somebody who like this is their livelihood that they card wool in order to create fiber bundles or people who make soap. I get into these intensely deep conversations with them because I still have a curiosity about, well, what is the latest technology that exists yeah. now? And if you're going to make your own lie, like how do you, because it's hard to ship lie. They used to just carry lie in like an Ace hardware store, but they don't do that anymore because you can use it to make bombs. So I have already learned so much <laughs> that I did not know before. And I will say like the knitting thing, it may have been an obsession for a while, but I mean, you've got like nine books out of the, at least out of, you know, so. Yeah, I got nine books. Out of, yes. And so I ended up joining a, well, what was cool about learning how to knit is that I'm not a social person in general. And I would do, in my previous job, I used to work 
I was a biomedical researcher for, well, focus on a biostatistician for Epidemiology Center. And I'd have to travel all over the world and go to these different research sites. And I would, prior to learning how to knit, I would just sit in my hotel room after the business day was done. But once I learned how to knit, there's all of these knitting groups all over the world. And you can find them on this website called Ravelry, which I talk about in my books. And I would just look up a local knitting group that was occurring, let's say, the one that I went to the most was I'd have to go to London a lot. So I'd go to London in the United Kingdom and I would look up and I went to this knitting group and they would move all around London and meet in these different areas. And I'd go there every time I was in London. And it was great Mm -hmm. because I learned so much about the people in the area and the culture and all of that. So knitting is good for introverts. Okay. So, so knitting is one of your crafting areas. Were there other things that spawned off of this knowledge? Because you, you mentioned like wanting to do everything from the, like the very, very start. And you will get to your research in a bit here because you have a very fascinating research story, I'm sure, about a new <laughs> book. But I remember in the past you telling me and my co-host about like you went to a wolf sanctuary to do yes. some research and things. So, so what in addition to the knitting obsession, were there other crafty things that came about? Yeah, well, so I still make my own soap. I still make my own soap just because we as a family sort of got addicted to it once I started to make it because it real soap that's not a detergent that most soaps that you buy, like at the grocery store or whatever, they're basically detergents. It's like washing yourself with Tide. I mean, I'm sorry if that's hard for people to hear, but it really is. And it's fine if you enjoy washing yourself with detergent, you do you. But once we started using like actual soap, that's really just lye and fat and water. It just feels so good. Mm -hmm. And so I still make soap. I don't make my own essential oils. (laughs) Like looking back on that, that's, that was like, and making your own essential oils is basically the gateway drug to making moonshine because then you have everything you need to because you have the the still and all of that. And I'm really glad that I stopped myself because I can legit see I can see like an alternate reality where I'm I'm making my own like moonshine and then vodka and then rum yeah. and all of that. I will but say it's good only, that I stopped. I will say the only thing I know about making essential oils is there's a book that came it was a long time it was pretty popular it was called perfume the story of a murderer i don't know if you ever read this but it is about this um it was written in the night in the 1980s but it also became a very dark movie but it's a german book about this french person named jean baptiste grenois who i think might have been real but like it's a they're like a mass murderer who also makes essential oils and they were trying to get to like do emotional like they like do emotions have sense and like so my extent of understanding how to make essential oils comes from this very dark creepy old book about a murderer so I'm glad also that you're not making essential oils for that reason alone I'm probably upsetting a lot of people right now but that's well and maybe there I mean maybe this is a study that needs to be explored perhaps there is if not a causation a correlation between murderers and people who make essential oils I mean you have just maybe raised the research question of the century so so somebody get get, on that I'm gonna get emails (laughs) (laughs) I mean it's not a it's not an easy thing to make essential I mean you need a lot of greenery or whatever it is that you're using in order to make essential oils and we had I was part of a community garden where we used to live and I had all of these and I'm like out there pregnant gardening, right? Because I, everything I ate, I wanted to have grown myself. It was, Mm -hmm. it was bad. It wasn't, I should have probably sought professional help, but I didn't. And so now here we are with all of these skills that I can't use, but I was had, I had plans to like, you know, co-opt other garden beds for like fields of rosemary to make Uh the rosemary essential oils and yeah, but enough about murderers and essential oils. Yes. But did you know, and this is completely random, have you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher this word, aspergis, aspergis. So it's the beak of a giant squid. I know, just bear with me. Okay. It's Okay, so the beak of a giant squid, when a sperm whale eats a giant squid and they have their battle at the bottom of the sea. Yes. The... And stop me if you know this. This is, I thought was fascinating. And I didn't actually learn about this until I was writing a book called, um, it was the Laws of Physics trilogy. It was about a astrophysics. Anyway, uh-huh. so 
Okay, let me get back to the sperm whale. They cannot di- sperm whales cannot digest the beak of the uh, giant squid. Uh-huh. And so they, they, there's this substance that then covers the beak in the sperm whale's stomach. And this particular substance is what makes perfume perfume. Ambergris. Did you know this? There it is. There it is. Ambergris. People are going to think I'm smart. I looked it up while you were talking. Oh, okay, good. And I talk long enough. We make a good team. Yes, okay, right. so I found this incredibly fascinating. And when I was in my deep craft period, the, these balls, like these balls of, say it again, say the word. Ambergris. Ambergris. They wash up on the French coastline. And if you find one, you can, it's like a billion dollars or so. I mean, billion being a very scientific term there. Of course. But and then you can sell it because this is the stuff that makes like super expensive perfume. I'm sure at the, I don't actually, I haven't done enough research about this. I probably shouldn't be talking about it, but I'm sure they have synthetic version of this now. But yeah. like the real thing um, makes perfume last longer on your skin. It like makes the smell last longer and it's super expensive and fancy. I had all of these plans to fly to I, I mean this was complete insanity at the time I had all these plans to go to France to try and find it so that you know whatever and uh, yeah professional help was required you're the best oh, <laughs> I just love talking to you okay so you didn't make perfume thank no you I did make soap you did make soap you're still making soap yes you are you, are you still actually knitting? Are you still doing yes. your okay? So what's um still what's the most what's the most recent thing you've? Knitted? I'll show you. I have it right here. I never keep it far away, so I didn't go to like Italy and buy some cashmere goats. I just um, I'm knitting this thing. It's called a shawl recipe, and you can see it's kind of a mess. But this is it right here. So this literally, is. Penny has I for the people that will listen, and I will put up a, a video of this. I'll grab a, a screen grab and I'll put it on my Instagram account. Like, I literally asked, "Are you still knitting?" And within seconds, she reached off camera and grabbed a knitting kit. Like, had everything on the right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm making another one of these just because they're so easy to make, and I actually have a knitting. I have a local knitting group now. I'm so proud of myself. Where I like go out and talk to people on purpose. It's just- Do they know that you are? Penny Reed, creator of like the Knitting in the City series, and yes, are they aware? And they do. It, it's not a, and it's not like it's a whole thing. I mean, they never heard of my books before we moved here, and we moved here February 2020, right mm-hmm. before the pandemic. We moved into this house, right? Exactly. So we're trying to move and all this other kind of stuff. And my children, when they were of that age, they like to tell people oh my mom is an author and then oh it's always like that convert that awkward conversation you'll run Mm -hmm. into this like once you publish your book people their first question people ask are but is she a real author as though I'm the Easter bunny or something like that you know like but does she really exist does this you know and I'm not really sure what qualifies somebody as a real author that's like what's the metric there I I don't know. I, I, I'm I assuming people mean like published author, which is gross in and of itself. But like, I don't know. If I were you, I would just walk around with like at least three Winston Brother books at any <laughs> given time and just be like, I wrote these and also designed no. the covers. No, 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 no. What I like to do is I like to say, so they'll say, are, but are you like a real author? I'm like, probably not. I'm self-published, so probably not. So I enjoy... I don't know. I like that. Like little, no, I'm not real. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a real person. You know, I'm not a real boy. I'm a wooden, oh my gosh. you know, puppet or whatever. But then it always makes it super awkward when they then look, look me up online and then they like hunt me down and they're like, you are a real author. You look are. at you. And no, but it, that's an odd, that's an odd conversation. If you want to have it like the whole being self-published mm-hmm. as an author and the stigma around being self-published and that in society, you're not truly an author if you're self-published. So, I mean, and I don't know that I really, it's not really a a value or I can't decide if, I mean, there's so many pros and cons with being with a traditional publisher versus being self-published that it's really a personal, it's a personal decision. Well, and I feel like, so for me personally, like I'm trying to go the traditional 
publishing out. Just for anyone listening, if you haven't figured it out by now, Penny and I are going to go all over the place and you're just going to have to- Sorry, sorry. No, it's great. So for me, I'm trying to go the traditional publishing route just because like I have- a very demanding full-time job that I'm yeah. also working in. Like for people who aren't aware, when you are a traditionally published author from, you know, say Simon and Schuster, or Penguin Rand, I guess we could just say Penguin Rand and Mouse is like a catch-all for all publishers just about at this point. But like it's not the same for every single author, but on balance, you get some marketing assistance and they kind of uh-huh. help you with the process and everything. Whereas a self-published author like Penny, like you, and I don't know if you're still doing this, but I remember you telling me like you designed your covers. Like you literally were doing everything from printing to like shipping to doing everything, at least in the beginning. And like, but at this point, I feel like you have built up such a brand. And so like you have all of these very successful book series. Like the, the trade-off is you're not giving percentages of your book sales to the publishing house and things like that. So I, I'm not sure how that all works. I will let you kind of clarify, but like, like you said, there's give and take to both yeah. sides of it. So I have a publishing imprint that we started and we, it's called Smarty Pants Romance. And the goal was, I don't know if I told you this story, but people started writing fanfic of my books. And so right. they would, and I feel very, and I came, I come from fanfic. I used to write super nerdy, like science fiction fanfic. And I love the fanfic community. But when I saw people starting to write fanfic of my books, I felt kind of this internal uh, blah feeling because I, they were all this labor and they weren't getting paid for it. And it, that makes it hard for me to sleep at night. And so at the same time, there was this report that came out about diversity in publishing. And then uh, I don't want to quote the actual numbers. So I'm going to give you some sort of like, with the caveat that this is probably all wrong, but in absurd, the ball, though. it is pretty absurd that in this country, we have a certain percentage of individuals who let's say we have a, a percentage of black Americans that live in this country. And I want to say the number is 27%, but I could be wrong, but it's around, it's around that. there. Yeah. Yeah. And then the number of books that are published by traditional publishers by black Americans are like 3% or 4%. Yeah. or And so that's a huge disparity. Just anybody with a brain, I hope would think that, but I don't know, there might be essential oil listeners who might <laughs> want to murder people. So I don't know your audience. So when I saw that, and it was around the same time that I saw people were doing fanfic of I can see you laughing I'm sorry yeah. I'm so, I can't <laughs> open uh so what I what I thought to myself was well this is kind of convenient what I should do is I should do something about this so our publishing imprint Smarty Pants Romance is really just like a mentorship program for individuals who we pri- well we prioritize own voices stories so that might be neurodiversity, that might be disability, that might be um, biopic authors, what, whatever own voice story, we prioritize those and they're all written within my quote unquote universe. So typically they're characters that people are brand new characters, but sometimes these authors will write characters that I've created mm-hmm. and they are accepted as canon. So as truth within the particular, within my universe. Mm-hmm. And the goal there is that, not only are they, we're having breakout authors who are own voices authors that are writing their stories, but then on the back end, we're providing mentorship for them. Like, okay, do you want to be traditionally published? And if you do, let's help get you there. Mm -hmm. So we have had a number of authors who've gone on to be traditionally published and we've made those introductions and made that happen. But we do have a large share of authors who want to stay self-published. And so we teach them how to do that. This is how you create a relationship with editors, content editor, development editors, content editors, copy editor, blah, 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 blah. Mm-hmm. And I am actually an oddity in the um, self-publishing realm that I create, uh, that I make all my own covers. I'm strange. Most yeah. people go to professional cover designers and create their covers mm-hmm. with professional cover designers, but it, it actually turned out be, to be pretty handy in my imprint that I yeah. designed those covers too. We'll be back with more Passions and Prologues after this break. Hi there. I'm Heather Drago. And I'm Sarah Saunders. We host the podcast, That's a Hard No, about saying no and setting boundaries. So you can become that true and empowered you that this world needs. Saying no isn't just okay. It's the key to living an authentic, fulfilling life. I'm a licensed professional clinical counselor. 
So while this podcast is in no way a replacement for one-on-one therapy, I suppose I know what I'm talking about. I'd say so. We talk about learning to say no and set healthy boundaries and how it impacts mental health, physical health, relationships, parenthood, and more. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit our website, hardnopodcast.com. We're here to help you find your no and say it unapologetically. That's a hard no. And now, back to Passions and Prologues. Having heard now about the few the things that you're passionate about, just the ones we've talked about, like it makes sense to me how you might get a little bit obsessive with making the covers and like yeah. I, this this all tracks to me now mm. knowing these things about you. And I do want to ask about your research for for oh. one of your next novels because I want so like the way that I'm, I'll frame it is kind of the way I sort of frame it with other authors is like. I usually ask like how people's passions inspire their work. I feel like yours is pretty, like I said, like the knitting thing is pretty, like it kind of bleeds over. But mm-hmm. when you, I'll ask it this way, because I, I really want you to talk about the research because I'm so interested. <laughs> but when you decide to write a new novel or let's say like mm-hmm. a book in a, a new universe, you know, you're not going to write like a Winston Brothers series or or you're going to do like a spinoff. How do you determine like the, the thing you want it to be framed around and then like how do you go about that research and then please 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 tell everyone about your most recent research okay so i have a book series coming up that's going to be coming and um usually it starts with like a social question that i'm personally trying to understand or grapple with and i have this series coming out in the next couple of years it's jane austen retellings and all of the roles that were men in Jane Austen's books are now going to be women and all of the women are going to be men. So for example, in Persuasion, you have Captain Wentworth, who is this famous naval officer. In my book, it'll be a female astronaut and that she will be Captain Wentworth. She's captain. And then the male character who would be the Anne Elliot is an Andy Elliot. And he is kind of this, uh, washed up football star and this idea these social questions that we have of a traditional femininity versus traditional masculinity and toxic masculinity versus toxic femininity and and so I love the idea of exploring those concepts with Jane Austen's characters which are so beloved but they've also become these archetypes within the romance genre Mm -hmm. So you have like the grumpy sunshine, right? Where the sunshine is always tends to be the female. And if the sunshine is the male, then they call it a reverse grumpy sunshine, which I think Mm -hmm. is fascinating as though there aren't just as many grumpy women out there (laughs) as there are (laughs) grumpy men. And so why do we call it a reverse? You know, Mm -hmm. so that's, or there was this big um, thing that I watched blow up on TikTok. It's a, there's this genre called reverse harem. Mm -hmm. And as the, anyway, so I'm not going to get too into that because then, you know, I'll have protesters outside my house, but these ideas that we have about men versus women and gender in general and gender roles and gender fluidity and all of this stuff. And so I'm trying to work through it myself to understand it so that I can be informed and also do the least amount of harm in general. And so I decided to write this particular series. This uh, I have I have one of the books in, in draft, but to, so that I could think through it. So in Pride and Prejudice, so it's Pride and Dad jokes. The male character is Eli Bennett, and the female character is Darcy Williams, and she is a Darcy. She's this kind of socially awkward, grumpy billionaire, and he's this super clever, you know somewhat naive uh, individual who is working at a startup and with all these other guys. So I just want to work through those, those gender norms where you flip the script on these archetypes. So that's how I come up with book series is I'm trying to grapple with how I think and what I believe about a particular issue. So that leads me into my current book that just came out called Folk Around and Find Out. So I want to be very careful with that first word. Yeah, great work. 
bulk around and find out where the main male character was a strip club owner. And he uh, has been like this. He was a strip club owner throughout the entire Winston Brothers series. And I had a lot of and I'm going to say a lot as a qualifier because I, I do think it's a lot. So I went to college in Tampa in Florida. And Tampa is some, in case you didn't know, I mean, you can't be from Tampa and not know this, but it's renowned for its strip clubs. Mm -hmm. There's one in particular called Mons Venus. So it's supposed to be like the Mons Venus of strip clubs. I mean, I don't know how else to put that. Yeah, the the tracks, I get it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so there were a number of girls in my honors dorm who were strippers. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to say a lot because I don't know how many strippers you know or how many... Usually it's not a lot, right? I don't think I know any at this point. I'm, I right. I did have a friend who dated a stripper and oh, I hope he doesn't listen to this, but I will, never will forget. Like, I remember him telling me a story about him, his dad getting a lap dance from his girlfriend. And I was like, well, you can't date that person anymore. I'm sorry, because that's just on principle. That's, I was like, I couldn't possibly watch a significant other give a lap dance to my father. I'd beg, it would just, everything would be melting you in know, my brain. I don't know, because after doing my research, I can understand that it's not that big of a deal. And let me tell you why. Because the majority of it wasn't just when I was in college and I I would talk to these young ladies at the time and Mm -hmm. I couldn't wrap my mind around being a stripper or making use of my body in that way. I grew up super in a super conservative household and Mm -hmm. there was a lot of shame. So when you have a lot of shame associated with your physical person, just not because of what I look like or didn't look like, it was just like, that's how you grow up is with Mm -hmm. all the shame. And so these women just didn't seem to see it as that big of a deal, like being naked or touching people or having people touch them or whatever it was. And I wanted to understand that. And so when I talked to them, Each of them said that when they give somebody a lap dance or somebody stuffing money in their G-string or whatever it is, that they're always imagining that person as somebody else every single time. Mm -hmm. So they're never giving a lap dance to the person who's in front of them. They're giving a lap dance to their stand-in. That's the word that they used was stand-in. And they had some rules or things that they kept in mind to keep from being taken advantage of because it is a the way that our government has set it up and like Mm -hmm. local ordinances and all of that, it has put the onus on the stripper rather than on the person who's receiving the service, which I can somewhat understand, except for that's not really how a lot of other industries are treated. For example, gun manufacturers in this country, Mm -hmm. they can't be sued. They have the service and we as consumers are responsible for how we use their goods. But the same isn't said for humans. Like we don't mm-hmm. protect humans in the same way that we protect guns, which I think is fascinating. Yeah. No judgment, whatever. I, Sorry. To I, all I will clarify. No, you're good. I will clarify. I wouldn't have a problem dating someone who was a stripper. <laughs> my situation would be my father had a very enjoyable time with my significant other who was giving him a lap dance it would be not i would not be like shaming my significant other it would be me being like hey dad there's like 20 other people working here you could yes. ask this for that would be my my brain yeah thing. so the issue is with the father correct the significant other 100%. okay good. okay good glad we got the clear yep. so when i went circled back to do this book i reached out to some of the young or they're not, I guess they're my age. So old ladies, some of the old ladies I went to college with and um, I tried to reach out to them and a number of them returned my calls. And one of them actually helped me interview a strip club owner down in Tampa. And then the, I actually did some cold calls and ended up only one other strip club owner from another club in Tampa Mm -hmm. returned my call and I actually had the conversation. So when I had the conversation with the strip club owners, I, I'd like to think of myself as a very open-minded person, especially when I'm conducting research into character development. And I want to know, I feel like there's so few people who are irredeemable, meaning like Mm -hmm. in general, it's like this, I mean, if you look at the statistics, I think 3% of all people who are born and turn out to be sociopaths, but whatever, that's like a mental thing. So I don't think these individuals, these men were sociopaths. I think they were just really stupid. Like really dumb. And so they, the individuals that I 
interviewed uh, strip club owners. And again, it was only two. So maybe like the decent ones wouldn't return my calls. Mm -hmm. The sense I got was that they just wanted to be in a position of power over young, attractive women. And that was disappointing to me. And I can't write a hero who's like that, right? Like, why would I write that book? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like, why would I write a book about that kind of person getting a happily ever after? In the literal sense, not in the biblical sense, but maybe both. (laughs) Okay, so... What happened is that I decided that in order to write a hero who was a strip club owner, he also had to have been a stripper at one point Mm. so that he could see it from that perspective and that he was protecting or making sure that the onus of responsibility was on the John or the consumer, not the dancer. And the other thing is that strippers don't like to be called strippers. I found in general, not maybe some of them do, whatever, but Mm -hmm. the people that I talk to prefer to be called exotic dancers. So Mm -hmm. there was a shift in the female perspective who was, she was not an exotic dancer. So she came in and her brain space, she referred to them as strippers at first and then eventually started thinking of them as exotic dancers. And so her internal monologues and also her speech reflected Mm -hmm. that. But the main male character who had been a exotic dancer the whole time, he only ever referred to them as dancers or exotic dancers or as his professionals or whatever it was, because that's truly how he saw them. And also setting up the boundaries from what I, my research talking to these women. And then also um, one of them was able to put me in touch with a couple of people who are currently, this is their current profession Mm -hmm. was the sense I got was that nine times out of 10, it's not an active choice to be doing that. Meaning that this is not a, this is just reflective of reality. This isn't Mm -hmm. a judgment call or a value judgment at all, but that this is a job that they're taking so that they can get through to what they really want to do. Mm -hmm. But sometimes this is what the person really wants to do. Like this is the job that they feel called to and they're because they're very good at it. And Mm -hmm. it's something where they excel. And isn't that what we all want to do is do a job that we're really, really good at. And we have talent and we're making really good money and our, our skills are being recognized and respected. And so the women who didn't want to ultimately be in that position felt taken advantage of. But -hmm. the woman that I talked to who wanted that role, she said, oh, no, nobody would ever take advantage of me. And the conclusion I kind of came to with that is if you're desperate, it doesn't matter if you're a lawyer or a physician or a podcast maker Mm -hmm. or a biostatistician or an author, but you're doing a job and you don't, and you feel trapped in that job or like you don't have any other options, it's exactly the same as being an exotic dancer and feeling trapped. You're going to feel taken advantage of. And so it's more about the mindset than it is about the work. And that was, that was super interesting. So the stand-in, every single one of them had a stand, every single mm-hmm. one of them. And I would ask like, who was your stand-in? Nine times, out of, again, nine times out of 10, it was always like a random famous celebrity, mm-hmm. but for some of them, it was their husband or it was an ex-boyfriend or, you know, something like that or a girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And then the stand-in was a common theme for all of them, um, putting up boundaries and mm-hmm. having good bouncers who are paying attention. So making sure that the bouncers are tipped out at the end of the night appropriately, make sure that the bouncer is keeping an eye on what's going on, setting up those really firm boundaries and making sure that wherever you're working is the club where you're working also enforces those boundaries, Mm -hmm. makes it a good club because some clubs don't, they don't look out for their dancers that way. They're just trying to bring people in to drink because that's where they make the majority of their money. money. Yeah. Um, But there are some clubs that don't, I did a deep dive into Tennessee because this is where the book takes place, Tennessee ordinances with what is and is not allowed at strip clubs. So I had to create like this in my author's note, I say, okay, I know this takes place in Tennessee. So the dancers could never be completely naked and the patrons have to be six feet away at all times. There couldn't be any lap dances and there's no alcohol allowed. So instead they do like a cup fee or like a coverage fee. And that's how the club makes their money. And the dancers are tipped far away, which means that the dancers aren't making as much money or getting as many tips as they would. So basically, it's all set up to discourage the business in general, Mm -hmm. which 
I don't know. Uh, logically, I have to think through this, and I'm not advocating for like legalization of prostitution or anything else. Mm -hmm. But it seems like if we're not, we as a society, well, never mind. I'm not going to go into my soapbox no, moment. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it just kind of seems silly that we can't create these safe places for individuals who feel like they have no other choice and they are willing to work. And this is a job but we can't create these safe places where they can maximize their income. That seems kind of silly, but whatever. Yeah, I don't know. Listen, as long as they're not making essential oils. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so, and we don't have um, to add them to our database. Yeah. I will just say, so I have one more question for you. Cause sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're great. This I is talk great. A lot. No, this is great. So I will just tell anybody, anyone who has never read a Penny Reed book, first off, just like go, I will put a link to her website. You can get one of her myriad books, but if you want to read uh full ground and find out it's out and available now, right? It came out in the middle of October. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that is available right now. You can get that of wherever, you know, books are sold online, but go through Penny's website. That's the best way to to, to do it. And you give her website traffic and everything too. But yeah, just read a Penny Read book. You're going to want to do that. But my last question for you, I always end with having the guests give us a recommendation. It could be a book. It could be an activity. It could be a TV show, a recipe. It could be to go make your own soap. But what's just a recipe? What's a a recommendation you have for my listeners before we sign off. So I am going to recommend people make their own soap because it's incredibly easy to do. Now, I know that sounds like, you know, whatever, but you can get, um, it's NAOH. So you get the, um, that's the lie that you buy and you can order that from Texas for whatever reason you can get food grade lie from Texas. Once you order that, and it's no big deal, just like two weeks, but store it in a, a, a dry place. And when you mix it with the water, make sure you're mixing, you're putting the lye into the water, not the water into the lye. Mm -hmm. You can go to this website called Soap Calc. I think it's soapcalc.net and go to the store, buy some coconut oil and olive oil. That's really all you need because the olive oil is good for cleansing and also moisturizing. The coconut oil is really good for lather and also for hardness. And then get the lye, and then you just need distilled water. So it's, and lye, this NAOH food grade, um, distilled water, olive oil, and coconut oil. Go to soapcalc.net and make your own soap. And then compare it against the detergent that you're typically using. I'm making no money from this. I'm not from the lye lobby or anything yeah, like that. You should have like a Smarty Pants soap available on your website, I'm just saying. Well, on my Instagram account, I do have in the, you know, collection of stories thing at the top, mm -hmm. I go through the entire process of making soap because I don't know why I feel so strongly about this, but it will change your life. Like I'm 84 years old. No, I'm not. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just like, it's like, it just makes such a difference just uh -huh. using versus all of the other stuff that's in. The, and you're going to feel like you're going to feel cleaner. You're going to feel better. You're going to feel like you didn't like take a bath in your washing machine. So well, yeah, that's I, what I'm going to That's push. a perfect recommendation. I will put all the links in the show notes, everybody, so you can find <laughs> soapcalc.net and Penny's website and everything. Uh, this is always so much fun. Penny, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. And I hope that you have a lovely non-denominational wintertime gift giving season. Passions and Prologues is proud to be an evergreen podcast and was created by Adam Sokol. It was produced by Adam Sokol and Sean Rule Hoffman. And if you are interested in this podcast and any other evergreen podcast, you can go to evergreenpodcast.com to discover all the different stories we have to tell.